glad I came to church tonight. Been good. Take your Bible this evening, if you would. Turn to Mark chapter 7. Thank you, Lisa. Mark chapter 7, please. For our scripture reading, we're going to read verses 31 through 37. Mark 7 and verses 31 through 37. And we'll read them responsibly, begin together on verse 31, then alternating reading until we end together on verse 37 of Mark chapter 7. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word and begin together on verse 31. Ready? And again, departing from the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, he came under the sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto him, Ephaphtha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much the more a great deal they published it. And were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this evening. Lord, thank you so much for the beautiful, wonderful music tonight. It has blessed my soul. And Lord, I, I know it's been a blessing to others here in this room, and we trust it's been a blessing to you as we sung with melody in our heart unto thee. And Lord, we're asking now that you would uh, continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. We want to hear from you. So I pray that each of us would be ready to give our careful attention to your word. Bless the special now as it's sung in Jesus' name. Amen. Once so aimlessly I wandered round the tangled paths of sin. All about me seemed so hopeless, doubts and fears without within. Then I wrote voice so kind and gentle, spoke sweet peace unto my soul. Gone my days of sin and wandering since the Savior made me whole. I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me and a whole new life he gave me, I have never lost the wonder of it all. Now my life is full of gladness, all my days are filled with joy. I no longer walk in sadness, happy songs my lips employ. For I've learned the wondrous secret only those in Christ can know. Tis a peace of sins forgiven, joy that makes my glad heart glow. I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me and a whole new life he gave me, I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me, and a whole new life he gave me. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Amen. That's good. So, Alfred B. Smith's song, and uh, Bob was sharing with me, he heard Alfred B. Smith sing that song in his 90s. 
singing that he's never lost the wonder of it all in his 90s. Isn't that great? Hope we never get over the wonder of it all. Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you for the opportunity we have to look into your word tonight. And Father, I'm asking for your help as we come to the preaching of the word. Lord, I pray that you'd help each one of us now to focus and to give you our attention this evening. That Lord, we'd not miss what you'd have for us tonight from your word. So Lord, open our understanding. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church this evening. Lord, while we've enjoyed the music and it's been a blessing to us and it's ministered to us and we've enjoyed the fellowship together with other believers, Lord, we don't want to go home without saying God spoke to us tonight through his word. And so, Lord, may we listen carefully, may we mix with faith the word of God that we hear tonight and help us each to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Use the word of God in our hearts and lives tonight, please, to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. If your Bible's open at Mark chapter 7, I want you to look again at that passage. And what the people said in verse number 37, after he healed a man who, had a, who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and uh, the Lord healed him and he spake plain, and, and they were beyond measure astonished, saying, He hath done all things well. Notice why they said that. Because he maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. And I'm going to talk to you now on that subject. He doeth all things well. You know, we're in a very self-centered time in our society. We react to many things based on how they make us feel. It used to be that you would be asked the question, what do you think about that? Or what do you think about this? Very rarely will you hear that. What you hear today is, how do you feel about that? Or that something took place and they asked people, how did that make you feel? And people live off their feelings instead of off the facts. And it's not wrong to have feelings. God made us emotional creatures and we have emotions but it is wrong to live by your feelings. It's not wrong to have feelings, but it's wrong to live by your feelings. We hear people say things like, well, I'm not very smart. No one would really want to talk to me. Well, that's how you feel. But is that really true? Is that really the facts? Or are you going off your feelings? Well, I'm just too old to ever get married. Well, is that true? I saw recently where a 94-year-old guy got married. How old are you again? Okay. There's, hey, you know, that's how you feel, but is that really the facts? See, if we're not careful, we go off our feelings instead of off the facts. Well, I'm not very attractive or I'm not very handsome. No one ever want me. Well, that's how you feel, but I've, Seen some people be attracted to others who was surprising to me. <laughs> yeah. And some of you are looking at your husband and wife right now. I won't say who, but yeah, there you are. You see, that can be a feeling, but it's, is it a fact? Is that really true? We've seen it. things bear out to maybe be the opposite. We base so much on how we feel. And, and the, the sad thing is, we carry that over in our relationship with God. And here's what, here's what modern Christianity has developed into, is God is there to make me feel happy. God is there to make me feel good. Therefore, when I go to church, the church is there so I'll feel good about myself. I'll feel good when I leave there. And we believe it's our God-given right for us to be happy, for us to feel good. And I'll give you an example. We have a, if you have a child that goes astray, a child that becomes a prodigal son, so to speak, parents ask themselves, why did this happen to me? Why do I have to go through this? Why is God doing this to me? 
You lose a job and you're unemployed. Why did this happen to me? How come I'm, how come I'm going through this? We get sick or we get a disease. And again, God, why are you doing this to me? What did I do wrong? Now, we may not say it publicly, but we say it privately. And we have that idea, again, is that this doesn't make me happy, so why is this happening to me? This couldn't be right, because I don't feel good about it. You see, here's the thing. Now, follow me. If, if we have our health, and there's food in the cupboard, and the bills are paid, and we have a job to go to, and a home to live in, then God is good. But if there's health problems, and financial difficulties, and marriage trouble, family issues, or unemployment, it's, God, why are you doing this to me? God, why are you doing this to me? Oh, I know, we say, God is good, and somebody always chimes in all the time. Let me hear you talk that way when you lose your job. You talk that way when sickness comes or illness comes or disease comes or tragedy comes. I want to establish a principle tonight with you, and I know you know it. I'm reminding you of it. And that is this. God loves you. Period. Unconditionally, forever, settled. God loves you. You can't, you, you can't deserve it. You can't merit it. You can't, uh, there's no conditions upon it. God loves you and God loves me. In fact, he loved us while we were yet sinners. Now, if he loves us unconditionally and undeservedly and un, without merit, then listen, that's how he desires that we love him. In the same way. Most of you know Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now it does not say in that verse that all things are good. It says He will work all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So I do not live for God because all things will be good. I do not live for God because all things will be good. I do not live for God because all things will turn out right. I do not live for God because I'll be happy. I do live for God because He will work all things together for my good. I do live for God and love God because it is the right thing to do. It is what He's commanded me to do. And I do love God and live for God because He first loved me. That's why any of us love Him. You see, the people in this passage here in Mark 7 made the statement that He hath done all things, or He doeth all things well, or He hath done all things well, because they saw Him heal a guy. In other words, Hey, if he can make the deaf to hear and the, 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 the mute to be able to speak and speak clearly, if he can make lame people to walk, if he can make blind people to see, if, if he can do those kind of things, then he does all things well. But what about when you're the Apostle Paul and you pray for him to take away your thorn in the flesh and he doesn't do it? Then what do you do? What do, you about, what do you do when you say, hey, everything's going to be all right. You're a child of God and everything's going to turn out wonderful. And you're John the Baptist. And you get your head cut off. What do you do when you're the early church and, and, and James and Peter have been arrested and, and, and James gets beheaded? He was killed by the sword. They probably cut his head off with the sword. Now, they had a prayer meeting and Peter got delivered. Ever think about that? We rejoice in that great answer to prayer and the great prayer meeting and Peter got delivered. And that is exciting. But, but I, I, I cannot believe that they didn't pray for James. I think that's why, remember, when Rhoda answered the door 
And they came and she ran in and said, Peter's at the door. Did they believe her? No. Because I think they prayed for James and what happened to him. <laughs> so they probably figured what I was saying was going to happen. That's why they didn't have much faith. But God chose to deliver Peter. You know what? God was good when James was killed, just as good as he was when Peter was delivered. God is still good. He still does all things well. Let me give you three observations. I'm not going to be long with you tonight. Just three observations for you to dwell on. Number one is we cannot determine good or bad. How many of you have young children at home or grandchildren, young grandchildren? Anybody here to sign? All right. Who do you think knows more, you or them? Okay. It's kind of a redundant question, isn't it? Don't need a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer that. Obviously, y your child would get up and say, I want ice cream for breakfast. I know. Don Taylor says, what's wrong with that, Pastor? I know. I understand, <laughs> Don, all right? But they are children here, all right? And <laughs> children will eat all the candy in the store. The other night at RU, Drew got a, a bag of M&M's. Not just the normal bag, I mean a bag. And he came home, and of course, what's he want to do? I'm going to eat them. It's 10 o'clock at night. Okay? You know what mom said? Mom says, we're going to put them in the freezer and you're going to eat them tomorrow. Okay? Now, did he like that? No. Was that popular? No. But she wasn't taking a poll. Okay? She said, that's the way it's going to be. But, but you understand, they, parents, know more than their children. Okay? Mom and dad know more than the child. Think about, think about the people of Israel. When they were going through the wilderness and they began to complain to Moses, they began to complain and they said, I think we had it better back in Egypt. Are you kidding me? Now, how many of you really believe that was true? No, it wasn't true. Now, was that how they were feeling? Yeah. But their feelings weren't right. Their feelings didn't match up with the facts. You see, you, 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 they thought they knew what was best and the Lord mercifully didn't grant them that request. The prodigal son. Did he think he knew better than his dad? He thought he was better off getting his inheritance and leaving home. He thought he was ready to handle it. Was he ready to handle it? No, he wasn't. See, he didn't know better. He thought he could determine what's good and what's bad or what's right and what's wrong, and he couldn't. That's why... God gives children parents. Okay? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So mom and dad, teach them what's right and teach them what's wrong. We don't determine in our life then what's good or bad. Now, if, if, my earthly, if earthly parents know more than their children, would our Heavenly Father know best when it comes to us? Doesn't that make sense? So should I determine what's good or bad? Or should I let God determine what's good or bad? Shouldn't I let Him be the one that determines that in my life and in your life? Shouldn't I let Him direct my path? Shouldn't I let Him guide my steps? Shouldn't I allow Him to be in control? Because it's not a matter of me thinking what's good or what's bad. Hey, how many of you can look back in your life, you're old enough, you look back in things where you said, you know, at the time I went through that experience, I thought it was horrible. And I, I didn't like it. And I would have told you this is a bad thing. But now, years later, I look back and I say, you know what? That was really a good thing that happened to me. God really used that in my life. And that ended up, I would look back now and say, that's a positive, not a negative. Anybody like that? Look at that hands all over the room. See, so we're not going to determine what's good and what's bad. Let God do that. That's God's department. And, and, and our department is simply to acknowledge Him. In fact, what I oftentimes think is bad may be just exactly what I need. 
And you know what that makes it? Good. Good. Okay? So we don't determine good for bad. Let me give you observation number two. Do not serve God because things will be good. Serve God because you love Him. I know God, without a doubt, gives us a reward principle in the Bible. He says, if you, in Malachi 3, about bringing the tithe into the storehouse, what did He promise? I will open up you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There will not be room enough to receive it. That's a tremendous promise. But I got news for you. If the windows of heaven don't open and the blessing doesn't pour out, you still ought to give God what's His. Because you love Him. See, that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. See, you just give because you love the Lord and because you want to, to, to obey Him. And, and, and I don't do it for what I can get from God. I'm doing it because I love him. You see, when people, when I talk to people and you, you, you talk to them about being faithful to God or maybe even talk to them about being saved because you're not sure they're saved, and they make the statement, well, I tried that, it didn't work for me. What are they saying? You know what they're saying? I tried that and I didn't get what I wanted. And since I didn't get what I wanted, I'm trying something else. You see, that they, they had it backwards. They were trying to serve God for what they could get instead of because I love Him, period. Why should you go to church? Because you love Him. Why should you uh, make yourself get up and spend time in His Word and spend time talking to Him in prayer? Because you love Him. You love Him. Why should you read and study and memorize and meditate in His Word? Because you love Him. Why do you want to be around the people of God whom He loves and whom He has saved and have a kindred spirit? Because you love Him. Remember when Hudson Taylor was recruiting workers to go to China to, to reach the Chinese with the gospel, with the China Inland Mission. They said, uh, you must be looking for people to have a great burden for the Chinese people. And Hudson Taylor said, no, not at all. They were somewhat surprised that they didn't want people that had a burden for the Chinese people. So what kind of people that are you, are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for people that love God. And God will give them a burden for the Chinese people. You see, they have to love God and, and love Him first. You ought to tell others about Christ because we love Him. We ought to help others because we love Him. Remember, what, remember when, when God brought Job up to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's no one like him? Remember what Satan accused Job of? He said, God, he serves you because you protect him. You've given him, look at the family, look at the business, look at the wealth, look at the health, look at all the things you've given to him. That's why he serves you. You begin to take that away and he'll curse you to your face. That's what he said. So God said, okay, I don't think he'll do it. I don't believe Job serves me because of what I've done for him. I believe Job serves me because he loves me. And that was really the test. And you know what happened. In one day, all that was gone. And what did Job say? The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I mean, I could believe Satan said, All right, man, I got him now, I got him now. And he looks down, and there's Job. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Devil went, huh? Guy, what's wrong with him? Then he got another idea. He said, oh, no, I'll tell you what. Let me touch his body. Buddy, a guy starts hurting physically, and uh, he'll, he'll curse you to your face. God said, you can touch his body, but you can't take his life. And boy, he struck him with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Painful. Pain all the time. And, and huh, Satan thought for sure that was going to happen. In fact, his wife even said, Honey, just curse God and die. I think she just wanted to get out of the misery. Just, just go ahead. And you know what he said? He said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. 
Boy, the devil had to shake his head and say, man, that guy, what is up with him? See, Job showed and he proved that he loved God. Not for what God could do for him, but because he loved him. Isn't that what got Joseph through? As he went through betrayal by his brothers, sold as a slave into the land of Egypt, and then falsely accused and thrown into prison. And then when he finally has a break because the butler gets out and, and he gets put back to his position, he says, hey, remember me. And two more years go by and he never remembers him. But as far as we know, as far as the scriptures tell us, Joseph never got bitter, never got angry, never got discouraged. He just kept on. If he didn't love God, that had never happened. God delivers him and raises him up and puts him next in command in all the country to Pharaoh. That's how he later on, Joseph could look at his brothers and say, fellas, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I see God doing all this. God, hey, you didn't throw me in the pit. God put me in that pit. God had to get me to Egypt. And then God put me in the prison. Why did God put me in the prison? So the butler who worked in Pharaoh's palace could get me to Pharaoh. Think about all that. See, he began to see God is in control of this thing. Not me. And I'm going to serve God because I love him. You know, life's not all smiles. Life's, life's not all sunshine. Life isn't all smooth waters. Serve God anyhow. Serve God anyhow. Oh, I, I can't tell you so many times when people have said, well, if I, had, if I just had so-and-so's life, boy, I could serve the Lord. And man, I know, uh, being the pastor, you know things. A bur I know burdens, heartaches, things that people carry in their life. And I just want to look at somebody and say, you wouldn't, you wouldn't ever trade places with them. You don't know what they carry. You don't know the load they have. But they just keep serving God anyway. They come and they smile and they sing and they serve and you have no idea the burdens they're carrying. Because they just serve God because they love Him. Let me give you observation number three. How you view the circumstances of life depends on your relationship with God. You see... When you love God and you know that God loves you, you see everything through those glasses. The unconditional love of God and the unconditional love for God. That's how Job could say, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's how Charles Weigel could pen the words after he gets a note from his wife saying, I'm leaving you, I don't want to live this Christian life, I don't want the life of an evangelist wife, I just want the lights of the city, I want what this world offers me. And she leaves him. And he writes, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. You see, you can't do that unless you know that God loves you. That's how John Bunyan could write Pilgrim's Progress from a jail cell. That's how H.G. Spafford could lose his children and still write, it is well, it is well with my soul. Would you determine tonight that he doeth all things well? Would you determine tonight whether you have all your children and all your business as well and everything is going smooth and everything's great and it's just like uh, you would want it to be, that you would say, blessed be the name of the Lord, but if He took it all away and you lost everything, would you still say, blessed be the name of the Lord? Would you still say, He doeth all things well? Just serve God anyhow. He doeth all things well. You see, I'm still deserving of hell. Anything God does above that is a bonus. I have eternal life because of what Jesus has done for me. 
Anything beyond that is just a bonus in the grace of God. Now let me help you with something. The Bible says when we run our race, we talked this morning in Sunday school about running the race with patience, and we keep our eyes on Jesus. You, you have to keep your eyes on Him. I'll give an illustration. A young Christian went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I'm not going to come to church anymore. The pastor responded, Why not? And the young Christian said, Well, I heard one of the ladies talking bad about another lady. I heard one of the brothers that he can't even read very well. I know a Sunday school teacher that isn't living the way they're supposed to. I see people looking at their phones during the church service, not listening. And there are many other things wrong in the church I've seen too. And the pastor said, okay. But before you go, he said, I want you to do something for me. The fellow said, okay. And the pastor went over and got a glass and he filled it with water right up to the top. And he said, I'd like you to walk around the church three times without spilling a drop of this water. And the young man agreed. He said, after you're done doing that, if you want to leave the church, you can. <laughs> young, young Christian thought, this is too easy. He walked three times around the church as the pastor had asked. When he finished, he told the pastor he's ready. And the pastor said, were you walking, when you were, let me ask you, he said, when you were walking around the church with a glass of water, did you hear any ladies speaking bad about another lady? He said, no. He said, did you see uh, anybody looking at their phone? He said, no. Did you notice how anyone else was living? He said, no. And then the pastor asked him, do you know why? And the young man said, no, why? He said, because you were focused on the glass so you wouldn't spill a drop of water. It's the same with our life. When you stay focused on Jesus Christ and keep your eyes on Him, you don't have time to see the mistakes of others. You don't have time to see the shortcomings of others. One of the surest ways to get messed up in your Christian life is to look at everybody else and worry about what everybody else is doing. Just keep your focus on Jesus. Fanny Crosby was blinded at six months of age by a doctor. We talked about it just briefly in our 530 class. And again, if you got word that a child, by the mistake of a doctor, was blinded at six months of, year, six, six months of age, what would, you, what would your first reaction be? Oh, that's terrible. Oh, how sad. Oh, that's awful. In our day, we'd say, I wonder if they'll sue the doctor. But wait a minute. We say it's bad. We say it's awful. You know what Fanny Crosby said? She said, what a blessing. She said, if I hadn't had been blinded, I never would have penned over a thousand hymns. Never would have done that. So she looked on it not as a bad thing, but as a good thing. She said, as a matter of fact, the first face I'll ever see will be the face of my Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, it was a good thing. She wrote the words, all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy? who through life has been my guide. Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Lord, I ask you to Put it deep in our hearts that you do all things well. That you know what's best for us in our life. That we will always view the circumstances of our life through the glasses of your unconditional love for us. 
Father, I pray that we'll, you'll help us to keep our focus and keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Help us to run with patience the race that is set before us. Lord, I pray tonight several things that some are going through hard times and some are going through some deep waters. But you still do all things well. That We claim the promise that not all things are good, but you can work them together for good if we love God and are called according to his purpose. And so, Father, let us trust you. Let us rely upon you. We love you. And you do all things well. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. We'll have our invitation. I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart tonight. It might be that the circumstances of life are heavy, some things going on, and you begin to doubt what God's doing. Maybe you looked at some things in your life and determined they're bad, and the truth is they may be just exactly what you need because God knows what's best. I wonder if you look at your life, maybe God's spoken to your heart about that. Maybe tonight it's you've gotten to looking at other people instead of keeping your eyes on Christ. Keeping your eyes focused on Him so you don't even see, don't even notice the shortcomings of others because you're fixed on Jesus Christ. I wonder how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me tonight, Pastor. Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart tonight. Respond to him, will you? Just come and bow the knee. And ask him to help you. To remind you that he does all things well. That you don't determine good or bad. You'll leave that in his hands. You're going to love him, and you're going to love him unconditionally, and just as he loves you. And you're going to keep your eyes focused on him, not on others. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. May your will be done in each one of our hearts and lives, please. Help us in these next few moments to spend time with you. Allow you to search our hearts. Whatever you touch on, God, may we respond what you tell us to do and I'll thank you for it with your heads bowed you stand to your feet as you stand to your feet our pianist will play as she plays Brother Bob's going to sing the invitation song God has spoken to your heart respond to him my Savior leads me that's right that's right to ask beside can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide Heavenly peace, divine is comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me mercy for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter and my soul a thirst may be, Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings its flights to realms of day, 
this my song through endless ages Jesus led me all the way this my song through endless ages Jesus led me all the way All right, go ahead and be seated for a couple minutes, if you would. We're going to bring the nursery workers up here and get the nursery emptied out. We've got something special to do here this evening. All right, are they coming? Want everybody to be in here? Are they all coming? Are they all going to come? They all should come in. Yeah, all of them should come. (laughs) We have Jeopardy fans in the crowd, I see. Oh, we'll know when they're here, don't worry. <laughs> we'll know. All right. Tanya, why don't you just keep right on coming up here, would you please? Stand beside Bob. <laughs> I know you love this, okay? And uh, get out from behind there. Get up here where you can see it, right? I'm going to use this thing. Um, you have 10 years with us here at Bible Baptist Church. I don't know if you realize that or not. Uh, 2007 to 2017, you came back and uh, began to serve with us here, and uh, we want to honor your service for us for 10 years. And uh, that's what's been going on that you don't know about, all right? (laughs) That's how hard it is to do something around here without Bob knowing about it. (laughs) It ain't easy. And, uh, but we have, uh, we have some nice flowers for Tanya, (laughs) okay? Those are for you. And we do have a nice gift we want to give to you. You want, want you to open this so you can look at it, all right? Please do that. You have the card here too, Tom. You can open that later. Just rip it. Rip it and rip it. It's all right. We, uh. I'll read this for you. 
This says, celebrating 10 years of faithful service to Bob Reed, director of music at Bible Baptist Church, Grove City, Ohio, in appreciation for 10 years of faithful service to our Lord. Your talent and passion have lifted our hearts and raised our voices in joyful noise to the Lord. May the Lord continue to use you and Tanya to bless others by your singing and by your loving service to the Lord. June 2017. And that's for them. Amen. You can be seated. We'll let them stay here for a minute. Um, what I want you to do here, if, in fact, a couple guys with microphones, let's do this, all right? Remember how we uh, did one word? I want you to do one word for Bob and Tanya, all right? Or Bob or Tanya, okay? Ladies, you just say something to Tanya, you can. If you when you say something to Bob, you can. Just uh, one word that uh, sums up what you think of them. Emma Jean wants to say something. Okay, this ought to be good. Okay. <laughs> Emma Jean, what do you have? Sweet. Sweet. There you go. Amen. Faithful. Faithful. Good. Just keep going. Just stick your hand up and they'll get you a mic. Go right up and down. There we go. S servant. Servant. Amen. Friendship. Friendship. Encouraging. Amen. Behind Helpful. you. Helpful. I'm sorry? Helpful. Helpful. Okay. Dedicated. Dedicated. Loving. Loving. Talented. Talented. Charity. Devoted. Charitable. Charity. Charity. Love, charity. Sunshine. Okay. All right, gotcha. Sunshine. Sunshine. Wow. Sunshine. Amen. Beautiful people. Amen. Great, grateful. Grateful. Soldier. Soldier. Sample. Sample. Gifted. Gifted. Amen. Trustworthy. Amen. Good. Sister. Loyal. Loyal. Amen. Cindy. Loyal. Enthusiastic. Amen. For the poll label right in front of you. Church music. Church music. Amen. Amen. Good. Did I say something that wants to? Pillar. Pillar. Good Are health they? and happiness. What what did you say? Health and happiness, okay? All right. Did someone say something back? What did Leland say? Pillar. He said a pillar. Pillar. Amen. John? Reliable. Reliable. Amen. Amen. Emma Jean, you want another one? <laughs> She's your biggest fan, huh? Compassionate. <laughs> Compassionate. Good. Are you in trouble or anything? <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet, Emma Jean. That's really sweet. Good job. Encouraging. No, Encouraging. Good. Amen. You don't know, you know, when, I, I, I haven't seen anything recently, but I know the last statistic I heard is the average pastor only stays about two years at a church, and I tell you what, the average assistant pastor, our second man, stays fewer than that, maybe six months. Uh, to have somebody stay and be in the background and, you know, uh, just, just work behind the scenes, be the second man, so to speak, for ten years is just pretty amazing. And I know that this church would not be, we wouldn't be where we are if it weren't for Bob and Tanya Reed. Uh, they're that important to our church and to the ministry here. And uh, I know he, if you think that he wants to spotlight it all, you, you don't know Bob Reed. Uh, he would much rather uh, be behind the scenes and not be seen at all. 
uh, he really, they don't just serve, they really are servants. And they don't desire the spotlight at all. In fact, they, they probably are hoping this would end real quick. <laughs> and uh, I know that's what they, they, they would feel. We've, we've also got some things over in the fellowship hall. That's why you couldn't get in there. You wonder what was going on. Um, we didn't have cake. We do have a chocolate fountain. And <laughs> you get to go first at the chocolate fountain. How's that? And you can take your sweet kids with you, all right? But would you like to say anything? Come on. It's uh, pretty amazing to think of the years. Um, I, I really didn't think 10 years. Actually, I was, I was trying to figure out what in the world is going on. <laughs> Pastor, he doesn't have to tell me everything, but usually I have a good idea as to what's <laughs> happening as far as schedules go, and uh, nobody was offering, so I didn't ask. But um, it, it and thinking over the last ten years and just uh, seeing um, uh, where where we were and where we've come and uh, where I was and where the Lord's brought me and um, uh, starting out as. Uh, single uh for one um until the lord brought us both here and um but it was just it really was has been just an amazing journey and um man i i can't i just can't imagine uh being anywhere else i really really love the folks here at bible baptist and the um the mission of bible baptist and the direction of bible baptist and the the uh, just uh, ev everything is just pretty it's pretty amazing and uh, what an honor it has been uh, these last um, I guess 10 years and um, it's it really is uh, beyond uh, beyond what words can say amen is that good enough Tanya? yep all right <laughs> <laughs> amen that's good We're going to have a word of prayer now, and uh, then we'll let them go over first and get it. Then they have a special place they'll sit, so you can feel free to come up and talk to them once they have their uh, food there. And then uh, the ladies will give you instructions. You'll, you'll see how everything will work, uh, places to sit and such, before you take your turn up at the fountain. And just make room, because I think I may just stick my head under there and open my mouth <laughs> and I let it come in. Yeah. What a way to go, huh? And... Uh, we're excited. We, we appreciate Bob and Tanya Reed. And uh, let it, hope you'll express your love to them and gratefulness for their service for the Lord here. And uh, like I say, many of the things they get, uh, that they do are behind the scenes and don't always get visible. But boy, we're thankful for the talent God has given them and the gifts he's given them musically. It has helped us tremendously in our church. And uh, we're grateful for them. Let's stand together, shall we? Father in heaven, we bow before you tonight. We thank you again for Bob and Tanya and, Lord, for their family and uh, what we have seen you do in them and through them and during these 10 years. What a delight it is to serve with people who love you and just desire to serve you with their life. I pray, Lord, that you and your goodness and your kindness would allow us to serve together with them, Lord, for many years to come or until you come back for us all. Now, Father, we pray your blessing on our fellowship together tonight. Uh, bless the food and our conversation. And, Lord, I pray that each of us would be able to express our love and appreciation for the service that Bob and Tanya have given to our church for 10 years. Well, thank you, Lord, for what you'll do in our midst tonight. And may you continue to have your hand of blessing upon us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. Hey, let's go ahead and sing anyway while they go out, okay? Let's sing. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Is Lisa there? She is. All right. You're going to get your kids and ready to head over. All right. Here we go. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. We'll see you next door.